One of the most prominent aspects to life on the American frontier was the ominous atmosphere of lawlessness that followed folks across the Mississippi River and into the territories of the Wild West. While there was an undeniable presence of the US government and many large establishments dotted throughout the frontier, such as army forts and major trading centers, smaller settlements weren't as fortunate. This allowed for homesteaders and communities all across the western United States to feel vulnerable as bandits and criminals scoured the lowest of valleys and the highest of hillsides to take advantage of the unprotected and make a living in a world where winners take all. Some of these infamous outlaws included the likes of Jesse James and Billy the Kid, popular figures of the Wild West's heyday that staked their claim to fame via ruthless train robberies, invigorating gunfights, and more often than not, cold-blooded murder in the name of glory and riches. However, the western frontier was too massive for only a few fabled criminals to take all of the gold and greatness for themselves. Alongside these major players were hundreds of smaller bandits who had once teamed up with the larger-than-life criminals to form a posse history would never forget. To understand their role on the American frontier and get a better picture into the lives of the gunfighters we rarely speak of, we're introducing the story of the Rufus Buck Gang and the tale of their short-lived villainy on the plains of the Old West. The Ballad of the Rufus Buck Gang all started with its titular outlaw's lust for notoriety and distaste for two-faced white settlers infiltrating the land of his people. He was born circa 1875 on the rolling plains of the Indian Territory, his father a devoted member of the Creek tribe, and his mother a freed black woman. Like many youths of modern-day Oklahoma, Rufus was left to his own devices, learning to survive on the plain as nothing more than a child. More importantly, he bore witness to his father's hatred of the white influence on the Creek peoples, watching as they won the majority and pushed more and more Native American tribes onto reservations. Reservations known for their horrible living conditions and disregard for indigenous life. While he was certainly fueled by his anger, Rufus was simply a product of his environment, eager to make a name for himself alongside the countless criminals plaguing the territory. He was known to rustle horses, commit petty thefts, and act as a thorn in the side of lawmen, even as a child. Known by many as a troubled youth, Rufus was in and out of jail at Fort Smith, Arkansas, more than he could count, all by the age of 18. Over the next couple of years, Rufus thought long and hard on his next major move. He'd grown tired of sitting in a prison cell for little misdemeanors here and there, and felt he could make his mark on the frontier in a much more grandiose fashion, for better or for worse. By the time his 20th birthday rolled around in 1895, the young buck had schemed his ultimate plan. He rounded up four other black, Native American, or mixed young men to form his very own gang, aptly called the Rufus Buck Gang, to carry out his chaos in the summer of 95. His hope was to force the hand of white settlers, wishing to drive them out of Indian territory once and for all. The rest of the gang consisted of Mahoma July, Sam Sampson, and Lucky and Lewis Davis. A couple of them were mere teenagers, but in the era of the Wild West, they were considered of age. Together, the crew went around the territory, stealing weapons for their makeshift armory, located in Okmulgee, Oklahoma. The stockpiling of guns meant only one thing. They were intent on creating chaos never before seen. Rufus Buck himself was quoted that summer, saying, his outfit would make a record that would sweep all the other gangs of the territory into insignificance. It quickly became clear the gang was no longer interested in civil rights, but rather laying waste to whomever got in their path, regardless of their race or heritage. These vicious intentions 
were no more apparent than after their first major crime on July 30th, 1895. It was a sweltering summer afternoon in Fort Smith when U.S. Deputy Marshal John Garrett was alerted of an attempted robbery at a local grocery store. He rode like lightning to the storefront, a devoted lawman and one of the few African-American marshals employed within the Indian Territory. When he arrived, he saw the likes of the Rufus Buck gang pillaging the shelves and attempted to intervene. Buck and company had no time for legal intervention, though, and shot down Garrett without remorse. The black marshal died at the scene, and the gang made off with their first big score. The following day, on July 31st, Buck and his four boys were bloodthirsty once more. On a casual ride across the plain, they happened upon two white folk in a wagon, a father and daughter minding their own business. Bothered by nothing in particular, the gang stuck up the man, rifles pointed at his heart and head. The daughter, meanwhile, was kidnapped by those unarmed. She was taken away, sexually assaulted and beaten. Left behind, the poor girl would die from her wounds, and the Rufus Buck gang would ride away unscathed once more. For the next couple of weeks, the belligerent bandits would revert back to robberies, targeting shops and general stores dotting the Indian Territory. In one instance, they ransacked the shop operated by an elderly man called Ben Callahan. In a sick twist, the gang told Callahan they'd let him live, but on one condition. If he could outrun the boys, he'd survive to tell the tale. Outrun them is exactly what Callahan did. However, Buck and company were none too pleased. With their egos bruised, the deadly desperados did what they knew best. They approached the shopkeeper's assistant, a young African-American boy, and shot him point blank in the head, killing him instantly. They then rode after Callahan, beating the old man to a pulp before stealing his saddle, boots, and the little money he claimed. He survived only because they thought he died after falling unconscious into a puddle of his own blood. The pillaging posse of violent teenagers continued their thievery in Orchid, Oklahoma, robbing the J. Norberg and West Country stores. When they didn't want to hit a place of business, they target stockmen or ranchers. On one occasion, they stole a man of his clothes and shoes while firing at his naked backside as he fled into the horizon. On another occasion, they targeted a horseman by the name of Gus Chambers, murdering him in cold blood when he fought back against their attempt to rustle his horses. Two days after the assassination of Mr. Chambers, the Rufus Buck gang would commit their most vile set of atrocities. On August 4th, they ran into a Mr. and Mrs. Hansen outside of Sepulpa and decided that the couple would be their next victims. After holding up her husband with an array of Winchesters, Rosetta Hansen was repeatedly gang raped by the gang. She was so badly maimed, she'd later die as a result of her injuries. Three other female victims, named Miss Ayers, Mrs. Wilson, and a 14-year-old Native American girl, were assaulted by the five criminals. Two of them, Miss Ayers and the teenage girl, were murdered. And while there was never confirmation, it was widely believed Mrs. Wilson survived and provided vital testimony to law enforcement. Five days after the rape and killing of Rosetta Hansen, the Rufus Buck gang would finally meet the end to their dastardly 10-day crime spree. After a series of attacks on a local Creek community, a massive posse of lawmen ascended upon the boyish outlaws. Supervised by Marshal S. Morton Rutherford, a team of both U.S. deputies and the Creek Light Horse Police cornered the gang near Muskogee. For 24 hours, the lawmen and Rufus Buck's entourage engaged in a standoff, the posse unwilling to back off from the outlaw teenagers. Ultimately, the gang couldn't outshoot their lawful counterparts and surrendered after an entire day and night of gunfighting. They were promptly arrested and thrown in the nearest jailhouse with maximum security patrolling around the clock. At first, it was thought the gang would be lynched, 
angry mobs of vigilantes demanded the hangings of each member. Creek Nation asked the boys to be tried in their reservation court system, beyond unsettled by the damage they brought to their tribe and Indian territory in general. The United States government had other ideas, though, and figured leaving them in Oklahoma would certainly end in five lynchings. Instead, the Rufus Buck Gang was transferred to Fort Smith, where the legendary hanging judge, Isaac Parker, awaited them. The U.S. District Court held jurisdiction over the territory and sought the same capital punishment anyway. For almost a year, the five teenage outlaws were in and out of court. The initial trial, in which each boy was convicted of rape and murder, was a swift process. But of course, the gang fought for an appeal. It went all the way to the Supreme Court, but SCOTUS would have none of it. The appeal failed, and Judge Parker resentenced them to death. On July 1st, 1896, the Rufus Buck Gang was executed by hanging at 1 o'clock p.m. in Fort Smith, Arkansas. The terror of the Rufus Buck Gang might have been short-lived, but their murderous and evil exploits would be long remembered by history. Make no mistake, Rufus Buck was no civil rights martyr, and the gang was not a symbol of Native American justice, as some reports may lead you to believe. Like most violent gangs of the Old West, they were nothing more than rapists and menaces, outlaws by name, but cold-blooded killers by practice. Maybe Buck truly wanted to scare off the white men at the beginning, angered by those who had settled on creek grounds by way of the land rush. But any semblance of martyrdom was taken over by a hunger for manslaughter. The gang was a scourge of frontier lawlessness. Nothing more and nothing less. However, as immoral and iniquitous as their actions may have been, their infamous legacy lives on. Their short-stinted yet undeniable mark on the West has influenced both literature and cinema, inspiring the films Hell on the Border and The Harder They Fall. Lest we forget their name, even if the Rufus Buck gang weren't worth remembering.